Chapter 11 British India from World War I to 1947 Later in 1912, Edwin Samuel Montagu, Mola's political protégé, who served as parliamentary undersecretary of state for India from 1910 to 1914, announced that the goal of British policy toward India would be to meet the just demands of Indians for greater share in government. Britain seemed to be awakening to the urgency of India's political demands just as more compelling problems of European war preempted Whitehall's attention. The ultimate goal of the Indian nationalists, the end of the Raj and independence, would have to wait for more than three decades while the world experienced two global wars that flanked a crippling economic depression. World War I and its Aftermath in August 1914, Lord Hardinge announced his government's entry into World War I. India's contributions to the war became extensive and significant, and the war's contributions to change within British India proved to be even greater. In many ways, politically, economically, and socially, the impact of the conflict was as pervasive as that of the mutiny of 1857-59. India's Contributions to the War Effort The initial response throughout India to Lord Hardinge's announcement was, for the most part, enthusiastic support. Indian princes volunteered their men, money, and personal service, while leaders of the Congress, from Tilak, who had just been released from Mandalay and had wired the King Emperor vowing his patriotic support, to Gandhi, who toured Indian villages urging peasants to join the British army, were allied in backing the war effort. Only India's Muslims, many of whom felt a strong religious allegiance to the Ottoman Caliph that had to be weighed against their temporal devotion to British rule, seemed ambivalent from the war's inception. Support from the Congress was primarily offered on the assumption that Britain would repay such loyal assistance with substantial political concessions, if not immediate independence or at least dominion status following the war, then surely its promise soon after the Allies achieved victory. The government of India's immediate military support was of vital importance in bolstering the Western Front and an expeditionary force, including two fully manned infantry divisions and one cavalry division, left India in late August and early September 1914. They were shipped directly to France and moved up to the battered Belgian line just in time for the first Battle of Ipers. The Indian courts sustained extraordinarily heavy losses during the winter campaigns of 1914-15 on the Western Front. The Myth of Indian Racial Inferiority especially with respect to courage in battle, was thus dissolved in sepoy blood on Flanders fields. In 1917 Indians were at last admitted to the final bastion of British Indian racial discrimination, the ranks of royal commissioned officers. In the early months of the war, Indian troops also were rushed to Eastern Africa and Egypt, and by the end of 1914 more than 300 triple zero officers and men of the British Indian Army had been shipped to overseas garrisons and battlefronts. The Army's most ambitious, though ill-managed, campaign was fought in Mesopotamia. In October 1914, before Turkey joined forces with the Central Powers, the Government of India launched an army to the mouth of the Shat al Arab to further Viceroy Curzon's policy of control over the Persian Gulf region. Albara, Basra, was taken easily in December 1914, and by October 1915 the British Indian Army had moved as far north as Alkut, Kut Alamra, barely 100 miles, 160 km, from Baghdad. The prize of Baghdad seemed within reach of British arms, but less than two weeks after Jen. Sir Charles Townshend's doomed army of 12,000 Indians started north in November 1915. They were stopped at Tessiphone, then forced to fall back to Alkut, 
which was surrounded by Turks in December and fell in April 1916. This disaster became a national scandal for Britain and led to the immediate resignation of India's Secretary of State, Austin Chamberlain. Edwin Montagu, Chamberlain's successor at Whitehall's India office, informed the British House of Commons on 20th August 1917 that the policy of the British government toward India was thereafter to be one of increasing association of Indians in every branch of the administration with a view to the progressive realization of responsible government in India as an integral part of the empire. Soon after this stirring promise of political reward for India's wartime support, Montagu embarked upon a personal tour of India. During his tour, Montagu conferred with his new viceroy, Lord Chelmsford, governed 1916-21, and their lengthy deliberations bore fruit in the montagu Chelmsford Report of 1918, the theoretical basis for the Government of India Act of 1919. Anti-British activity Anti-British terrorist activity started soon after the war began, sparked by the return to India of hundreds of embittered Sikhs who had sought to emigrate from their Punjab homes to Canada, but who were denied permission to disembark in that country because of their colour. As British subjects, the Sikhs had assumed they would gain entry to underpopulated Canada, but after W.R.E.T. Chait months aboard an old freighter, the Komagata Maru, in cramped and unsanitary conditions with inadequate food supplies, they returned to India as confirmed revolutionaries. Leaders of the Ghan Revolution Party, which had been started by Punjabi Sikhs in 1913, journeyed abroad in search of arms and money to support their revolution, and Lala Hardayal, the party's foremost leader, went to Berlin to solicit aid from the central powers. Muslim disaffection also grew and acquired revolutionary dimensions as the Mesopotamian campaign dragged on. Many Indian Muslims appealed to Afghanistan for aid and urged the Emir to start a holy war against the British and in defense of the Caliphate. After the war the Khilafat movement, an offspring of growing pan-Islamic consciousness in India, was started by two fiery orator journalists, the brothers Shokat and Muhammad Ali. It lured thousands of Muslim peasants to abandon their village homes and trudge over frozen high. Passes in a disastrous hijra flight from India to Afghanistan. In Bengal, terrorist bombings continued to harass officials, despite numerous preventive detention arrests made by Indian Criminal Intelligence Division Police under the tough martial law edicts promulgated at the war's inception. The deaths of Gokhale and of the Bombay political leader Sir Feroz Shah Mehta in 1915 removed the most powerful moderate leadership from the Congress and cleared the way for Tilak's return to power in that organization after its reunification in 1916 at Lucknow. That historic session in December 1916 brought even greater unity to India's nationalist forces as the Congress and the Muslim League agreed to a pact outlining their joint program of immediate national demands. The Lucknow Pact called first of all for the creation of expanded provincial legislative councils, four-fifths of whose members should be elected directly by the people on as broad a franchise as possible. The League's readiness to unite with the Congress was attributed to the Pact's stipulation that Muslims should receive a far higher proportion of separate electorate seats in all legislative councils than they had enjoyed under the Act of 1909. Thanks to such generous concessions of political power by the Congress, Muslim leaders, including Muhammad Ali Jinnah (1876–1949), agreed to set aside doctrinal differences and work with the Indian National Congress toward the attainment of national freedom from British rule. This rapprochement between the Congress and the Muslim League was short-lived, however, and by 1917 communal tensions and disagreements once again dominated India's faction-ridden political scene. 
Tilak and Annie Besant each campaigned for different home rule leagues, while Muslims worried more about pan-Islamic problems than all India questions of unity. The post-war years By Armistice Day, 11th November 1918, more than a million Indian troops had been shipped overseas to fight or serve as non-combatants behind the allied lines on every major front from France to Gallipoli in European Turkey. Nearly 150, triple zero Indian battle casualties, more than 36,000 of them fatal, were sustained during the war. India's material and financial contributions to the war effort included the shipment of vast amounts of military stores and equipment to various fronts and nearly 5 million tons of wheat to Great Britain. Also supplied by India were raw jute, cotton goods, roughened hides, tungsten, wolfram, manganese, mica, saltpeter, timbers, silk, rubber, and various oils. The government of India paid for all its troops overseas and, before the war ended, the Viceroy presented a gift of £100 million, actually an imperial tax, to the British government. The Tata Iron and Steel Company received Indian government support once the war started and by 1916 was producing 1 lakh tons of steel per year. An industrial commission was appointed in 1916 to survey the subcontinent's industrial resources and potential, and in 1917 a munitions board was created to expedite the production of war material. Wartime inflation was immediately followed by one of India's worst depressions, which came in the wake of the devastating influenza epidemic of 1918-19, a pandemic that took a far heavier toll of Indian life, and resources than all the casualties sustained throughout the war. Indians accounted for roughly half of the pandemic's total deaths worldwide. Politically, the post-war years proved equally depressing to India's great expectations. British officials, who in the first flush of patriotism had abandoned their ICS posts to rush to. The front returned to oust the Indian subordinates acting in their steed and carried on their pre-war jobs as though nothing had changed in British India. Indian soldiers also returned from battlefronts to find that back home they were no longer treated as invaluable allies but reverted immediately to the status of natives. Most of the soldiers recruited during the war had come from the Punjab, which, with less than one-tenth of India's population, had supplied as many as half of the combatant troops shipped abroad. It is thus hardly surprising that the flashpoint of post-war violence that shook India in the spring of 1919 was Punjab province. The issue that served to rally millions of Indians, arousing them to a new level of disaffection from British rule, was the Government of India's hasty passage of the Rolat Acts early in 1919. These Black Acts, as they came to be called, were peacetime extensions of the wartime emergency measures passed in 1915 and had been rammed through the Supreme Legislative Council over the unanimous opposition of its Indian members, several of whom, including Jinnah, resigned in protest. Jinnah wrote to Viceroy Lord Chelmsford that the enactment of such autocratic legislation, following the victorious conclusion of a war in which India had so loyally supported Britain, was an unwarranted uprooting of the fundamental principles of justice and a gross violation of the constitutional rights of the people. Mohandas K. Gandhi, Gujarat barrister, who had returned from South Africa shortly after the war started and was recognized throughout India as one of the most promising leaders of the Congress, called upon all Indians to take sacred vows to disobey the Rolat Acts and launched a nationwide movement for the repeal of those repressive measures. Gandhi's appeal received the strongest popular response in the Punjab, where the nationalist leaders Kichlu and Satyapal addressed mass protest rallies both 
from the provincial capital of Lahore and from Amritsar, sacred capital of the Sikhs. Gandhi himself had taken a train to the Punjab early in April 1919 to address one of those rallies, but he was arrested at the border station and taken back to Bombay by orders of Punjab's Lieutenant Governor, Sir Michael Odwire. On April 10, Kitlu and Satyapal were arrested in Amritsar and deported from the district by Deputy Commissioner Miles Irving. When their followers tried to march to Irving's bungalow in the camp to demand the release of their leaders, they were fired upon by British troops. With several of their number killed and wounded, the enraged mob rioted through Amritsar's old city, burning British banks, murdering several Britons, and attacking to British women. General Reginald Edward Harry Dyer was sent with Gurkha, Nepals, and Balochi troops from Jullundur to restore order. Jaliamwala Bagh Massacre Soon after Dyer's arrival, on the afternoon of 13 April 1919, some 10,000 or more unarmed men, women, and children gathered in Amritsar's Jaliamwala Bagh, Bagh Garden. But before 1919 it had become a public square to attend a protest meeting, despite a ban on public assemblies. It was a Sunday, and many neighboring village peasants also came to Amritsar to celebrate the Hindu Baisakhi festival. Dial positioned his men at the sole, narrow passageway of the Bagh, which was otherwise entirely enclosed by the backs of abutted brick buildings. Giving no word of warning, he ordered 50 soldiers to fire into the gathering, and for 10 to 15 minutes 1,650 rounds of ammunition were unloaded into the screaming, terrified crowd, some whom were trampled by those desperately trying to escape. According to official estimates, nearly 400 civilians were killed and another 1,200 were left wounded with no medical attention. Dyer, who argued his action was necessary to produce a moral and widespread effect, admitted that the firing would have continued had more ammunition been available. The governor of the Punjab province supported the massacre at Amritsar and, on April 15, placed the entire province under martial law. Viceroy Chelmford, however, characterized the action as an error of judgment and, when Secretary of State Montagu learned of the slaughter, he appointed a commission of inquiry, headed by Lord Hunter. Although Dyer was subsequently relieved of his command, he returned a hero to many in Britain, especially conservatives, who presented him with a jeweled sword inscribed Saviour of the Punjab. The massacre of Amritsar turned millions of moderate Indians from patient and loyal supporters of the British Raj into nationalists who would never again place trust in British fair play. It thus marks the turning point for a majority of the Congress's supporters from moderate cooperation with the Raj and its promised reforms to revolutionary non-cooperation. Liberal Anglophile leaders, such as Jinnah, were soon to be displaced by the followers of Gandhi, who would launch, a year after that dreadful massacre, his first nationwide satyagraha, Devotion to Truth, campaign as India's revolutionary response. Gandhi's Strategy For Gandhi, there was no dichotomy between religion and politics, and his unique political power was in great measure attributable to the spiritual leadership he exerted over India's masses, who viewed him as a sadhu, holy man, and worshipped him as a Mahatma, which, in Sanskrit, means great soul. He chose Satya, truth, and Ahinsa, non-violence, or love, as the polar stars of his political movement, the former was the ancient Vedic concept of the real, embodying the very essence of existence itself, while the latter, according to Hindu, as well as Jain, scripture, was the highest religion, dharma. With these two weapons, Gandhi assured his followers, an armed India could bring the mightiest empire known to history to its knees. His mystic faith magnetized millions, 
and the sacrificial suffering tapasya that he took upon himself by the purity of his chaste life and prolonged fasting armed him with great powers gandhi's strategy for bringing the giant machine of british rule to a halt was to call upon indians to boycott all british made goods british schools and colleges british courts of law british titles and honors british elections and an elective offices and should the need arise if all other boycotts failed british tax collectors as well the total withdrawal of indian support would thus stop the machine and non violent non cooperation would achieve the national goal of swaraj the concept of satyagraha hindi insistence on truth or zeal for truth was introduced in the early 20th century by mahatma gandhi to designate a determined but non violent resistance to evil gandhi's satyagraha became a major tool in the indian struggle against british imperialism and has since been adopted by protest groups in other countries according to this philosophy satyagrahis practitioners of satyagraha achieve correct insight into the real nature of an evil situation by observing a non-violence of the mind by seeking truth in a spirit of peace and love and by undergoing a rigorous process of self scrutiny in so doing the satyagrahi encounters truth in the absolute by his refusal to submit to the wrong or to cooperate with it in any way the satyagrahi asserts this truth throughout his confrontation with the evil he must adhere to non violence for to employ violence would be to lose correct insight a satyagrahi always warns his opponents of his intentions satyagraha forbids any tactic suggesting the use of secrecy to one's advantage dot satyagraha includes more than civil disobedience its full range of application extends from details of correct daily living to the construction of alternative political and economic institutions satyagraha seeks to conquer through conversion in the end there is neither defeat nor victory but rather a new harmony satyagraha draws from the ancient indian ideal of ahimsa non-violence or love which is pursued with particular rigor by jains in developing ahimsa into a modern concept with broad political consequences as satyagraha gandhi also drew from the writings of leo tolstoy and henry david thoreau from the bible and from the great sanskrit epic the bhagavad gita gandhi first conceived satyagraha in 1906 in response to a law discriminating against asians that was passed by the british colonial government of the transvaal in south africa In 1917 the first satyagraha campaign in India was mounted in the indigo growing district of Champaran During the following years fasting and economic boycotts were employed as methods of satyagraha until the british left India in 1947 Critics of satyagraha both in Gandhi's time and subsequently have argued that it is unrealistic and incapable of universal success since it relies upon a high standard of ethical conduct in the opponent the representative of evil and demands an unrealistically strong level of commitment from those struggling for social amelioration nonetheless satyagraha played a significant role in the civil rights movement led by martin luther king jr in the united states and has spawned a continuing legacy in south asia itself The Muslim quarter of India's population could hardly be expected to respond any more enthusiastically to Gandhi's satyagraha call than they had to Tilak's revivalism but Gandhi labored valiantly to achieve Hindu Muslim unity by embracing the Ali Brothers Khilafat movement as the premier plank of his national program launched in response to news of the Treaty of Severus dismemberment of the Ottoman Empire in 1920 The Khilafat movement coincided with the inception of Satyagraha thus giving the illusion of unity to India's nationalist agitation such unity however proved as chimerical as the Khilafat movement's hope of preserving the caliphate itself 
and in December 1920 Muhammad Ali Jinnah alienated by Gandhi's mass following of Hindu speaking Hindus left the Nagpur Congress the days of the Lucknow pact were over and by the start of 1921 the antipathetic forces of revivalist Hindu and Muslim agitation destined to lead to the birth of the independent dominions of India and Pakistan in 1947 were thus clearly set in motion in their separate directions prelude to independence 1920 to 1947 the last quarter century of british crown rule was racked by increasingly violent hindu muslim conflict and intensified agitation demanding indian independence british officials in london as well as in new delhi and simla tried in vain to stem the rising tide of popular opposition to their raj by offering tidbits of constitutional reform which proved either too little to satisfy both the congress and the muslim league or too late to avert disaster more than a century of british technological institutional and ideological unification of the south asian subcontinent thus ended after world war 2 with communal civil war mass migration and partition constitutional reforms british politicians and bureaucrats tried to cure india's ailing body politic with periodic infusions of constitutional reform the separate electorate formula introduced for muslims in the government of india act of 1909 the molamento reforms was expanded and applied to other minorities in the government of india acts 1919 and 1935 six and christians for example were given special privileges in voting for their own representatives comparable to those vouchsafed to muslims the british raj thus sought to reconcile indian religious pluralism to representative rule and no doubt hoped in the process of fashioning such elaborate constitutional formulas to win undying minority support for themselves and to undermine the arguments of congress's radical leadership that they alone spoke for india's united nationalist movement earlier official support of and appeals to india's princes and great landowners had proved fruitful especially since the inception of the crown raj in 1858 and more concerted efforts were made in 1919 and 1935 to wean minorities and india's educated elite away from revolution and non cooperation The Government of India Act of 1919 also known as the Montaguchan's Ford Reforms under which elections were held in 1920 increased the number of Indian members to the Viceroy's Executive Council from at least to to no fewer than 3 and transformed the Imperial Legislative Council into a bicameral legislature consisting of a legislative assembly lower house and a council of state upper house The legislative assembly with 145 members was to have a majority of 104 elected while 33 of the council of states 60 members were also to be elected enfranchisement continued to be based on property and education but under the act of 1919 the total number of indians eligible to vote for representatives to provincial councils was expanded to 5 million just one fifth of that number however were permitted to vote for legislative assembly candidates and only about 17000 elite were allowed to choose council of state members diarchy dual governance was to be introduced at the provincial level where executive councils were divided between ministers elected to preside over transferred departments education public health public works and agriculture and officials appointed by the governor to rule over reserved departments land revenue justice police irrigation and labor the government of india act of 1935 gave all provinces full representative and elective governments chosen by franchise extended now to some 30 million indians and only the most crucial portfolios defense revenue and foreign affairs were reserved to appointed officials 
the viceroy and his governors retained veto powers over any legislation they considered unacceptable but prior to the 1937 elections they reached a gentlemen's agreement with the congress's high command not to resort to that constitutional option which was their last vestige of autocracy the act of 1935 was also to have introduced a federation of british india's provinces and the still autonomous princely states but that institutional union of representative and despotic rule was never realized since the princes were unable to agree among themselves on matters of protocol the act of 1935 was itself the product of the three elaborate sessions of the round table conference held in london and at least 5 years of bureaucratic labor most of which bore little fruit the first session attended by 58 delegates from british india 16 from the british indian states and 16 from british political parties was convened by prime minister ramsay macdonald in the city of westminster london in november 1930 while jinnah and the aga khan three led among the british indian delegation a deputation of 16 muslims no congress deputation joined the first session as gandhi and his leading lieutenants were all in jail at the time without the congress the round table could hardly hope to fashion any popularly meaningful reforms so gandhi was released from prison before the second session started in september 1931 but at his own insistence attended it as the congress's sole representative little was accomplished at the second session for hindu muslim differences remained unresolved and the princes continued to argue with one another the third session which began in november 1932 was more the product of official british inertia than any proof of progress in closing the tragic gaps between so many indian minds reflected in earlier debate two new provinces emerged however from those official deliberations In the east Orissa was established as a province distinct from Bihar and in the west Sindh Sindh was separated from the Bombay presidency and became the first muslim majority governors province of british india since the reunification of bengal it was decided that burma should be a separate colony from british india in august 1932 to prime minister macdonald announced his communal award Great Britain's unilateral attempt to resolve the various conflicts among India's many communal interests. The award, which was later incorporated into the Act of 1935, expanded the separate electorate formula reserved for Muslims to other minorities, including Sikhs, Indian Christians, Anglo-Indians, Europeans, distinct regional groups such as the Marathas in the Bombay Presidency, and special interests. women organized labor business landowners and universities the congress was predictably unhappy at the extension of communal representation but became particularly outraged at the british offer of separate electorate seats for depressed classes meaning the so called untouchables gandhi undertook a fast unto death against that offer which he viewed as a nefarious british plot to wean more than 50 million hindus away from their higher caste brothers and sisters gandhi who called the untouchables children of god harijans agreed after prolonged personal negotiations with bhim rao ramji ambedkar 1891 to 1956 a leader of the untouchables to reserve many more seats for them than the british had promised as long as they remained within the hindu majority fold thus the offer of separate electorate seats for the untouchables was withdrawn the congress's ambivalent strategy gandhi promising his followers freedom in just one year launched on 1st august 1920 his first nationwide satyagraha campaign which he believed would bring the british raj to a grinding halt After more than a year and even with 60000 satyagrahis in prison cells across British India the raj remained firm and therefore 
Gandhi prepared to unleash his last and most powerful boycott weapon, calling upon the peasants of Bardoli in Gujarat to boycott land taxes. In February 1922, on the eve of that final phase of boycott, word reached Gandhi that in Chori Chora, United Provinces, 22 Indian police were massacred in their police station by a mob of satyagrahis who set fire to the station and prevented the trapped police from escaping immolation. Gandhi announced that he had committed a Himalayan blunder in launching Satyagra without sufficient soul cleansing of India's masses and, as a result, called a halt to the non-cooperation movement. He was subsequently arrested, however, and found guilty of promoting disaffection toward the Raj, for which he was sentenced to six years in prison. While Gandhi was behind bars, Motilal Nehru, 1861 to 1931, one of Northern India's wealthiest lawyers, started within Congress a new politically active party, the Swaraj Party. Motilal Nehru shared the lead of this new party with C.R. Chitta Ranjan Das, 1870 to 1925, of Bengal. Contesting the elections to the new Central Legislative Assembly in 1923, the party sought by anti-government agitation within the council chambers to disrupt official policy and derail the Raj. Though Gandhian non-cooperation remained the Congress's primary strategy, actual partial cooperation in the post-war reforms thus became the alternate tactic of those Congress leaders who were less orthodox Hindu or more secular-minded. In outlook, the Swarajists won more than 48 out of 105 seats in the Central Legislative Assembly in 1923, but their numbers were never quite enough to prevent the British from passing the legislation they desired or believed was needed to maintain internal order. Gandhi was released from jail in February 1924, four years early, after a surgery. Thereafter he focused on what he called his constructive program of hand spinning and weaving and overall village uplift as well as on Hindu purification in seeking to advance the cause of the Harijans especially through granting them entry to Hindu temples from which they had always been banished Gandhi himself lived in village ashrams religious retreats which served more as models for his socio-economic ideals than as centers of political power though the leaders of the congress flocked to his remote rural retreats for periodic consultation on strategy in many ways congress policy remained plagued by ambivalence for the remaining years of the raj most members of the high command aligned with gandhi but others sought what seemed to them more practical or pragmatic solutions to india's problems which so often transcended political or imperial colonial questions it was always easier of course for indian leaders to rally the masses behind emotional religious appeals or anti-british rhetoric than to resolve problems that had festered throughout the indian subcontinent for millennia most hindu muslim differences therefore remained undissolved even as the hindu caste system was never really attacked or dismantled by the congress imperial economic exploitation did however prove to be an excellent nationalist catalyst as for example when gandhi mobilized the peasant masses of india's population behind the congress during his famous march against the salt tax in 1930 which was the prelude to his second nationwide satyagraha the british government's monopoly on the sale of salt which was heavily taxed had long been a major source of revenue to the raj and by marching from his ashram at sabarmati near ahmedabad gujarat to the sea at dandi where he illegally picked up salt from the sands on the shore gandhi mobilized millions of indians to follow him in thus breaking the law It was an ingeniously simple way to break a British law non-violently and before years end jail cells throughout India were again filled with satyagrahis Many of the younger members of the Congress were eager to take up arms against the British 
and some considered Gandhi an agent of imperial rule for having called a halt to the first Satyagraha in 1922. Most famous and popular of these militant Congress leaders was Subhas Chandra Bose, 1897-1945, of Bengal, a disciple of C. R. Das and an admirer of Hitler and Mussolini. Bose was so popular within Congress that he was elected its president twice, in 1938 and 1939, over Gandhi's opposition and the active opposition of most members of its Central Working Committee. After being forced to resign the office in April 1939, Bose organized with his brother Sharad his own Bengali party, the Forward Bloc, which initially remained within the Congress fold. At the beginning of World War II, Bose was arrested and detained by the British, but in 1941 he escaped their surveillance and fled to Afghanistan, thence to the Soviet Union and Germany, where he remained until 1943. Jawaharlal Nehru, 1889-1964, Motilal's only son, emerged as Gandhi's designated successor to Congress leadership during the 1930s. A Fabian socialist and a barrister, the younger Nehru was educated at Harrow School and at Trinity College, Cambridge, and was drawn into the Congress and the non-cooperation movement by his admiration for Gandhi. Though Jawaharlal Nehru personally was more of an Anglophile aristocrat than a Hindu sadhu or Mahatma, he devoted his energies and intellect to the national movement and, at age 41, was the youngest elected president of the Congress in December 1929 when it passed its Puna Swaraj, complete self-rule, resolution. Jawaharlal's radical brilliance and energy made him a natural leader of the Congress's youth movement, while his Brahman birth and family fortune overcame many of that party's more conservative leadership's misgivings about placing him at the Congress's hem. The Purna Swaraj Resolution, proclaimed on 26 January 1930, later to be celebrated as Independent India's Republic Day, called for complete freedom from the British, but was later interpreted by Prime Minister Nehru as permitting India to remain within the British Commonwealth a practical concession young Jawaharlal had often warned he would never make. Muslim Separatism The Muslim quarter of India's population became increasingly wary of the Congress's promises and restive in the wake of the collapse of the Khilafat movement, which occurred after Kemal Ataturk announced his modernist Turkish reforms in 1923 and disavowed the very title of Caliph the following year. Hindu-Muslim riots in Malabar claimed hundreds of lives in 1924 and similar religious rioting spread to every major city in northern India, wherever rumours of Muslim cow slaughter, the polluting appearance of a dead pig's carcass in a mosque, or other clashing doctrinal fears ignited the tinder of distrust ever lurking in the poorer sections of India's towns and villages. At each stage of reform, as the prospects of real devolution of political power by the British seemed more imminent, separate electorate formulas and leaders of various parties stirred hopes, which proved almost as dangerous in triggering violence as did fears. The older, more conservative leadership of the pre-World War I Congress found Gandhian. Satyagraha too radical, moreover, far too revolutionary, to support, and liberals like Sir Tej Bahadur Sapru, 1875-1949, organized their own party, eventually to become the National Liberal Federation, while others, like Jinnah, dropped out of political life entirely. Jinnah, alienated by Gandhi and his illiterate mass of devoutly Hindu disciples, instead devoted himself to his lucrative Bombay law practice, but his energy, and ambition lured him back to the leadership of the Muslim League, which he revitalized in the 1930s. Jinnah, who was also instrumental in urging Viceroy Lord Irwin, later, first Earl Halifax, governed 1926 31, 
and Prime Minister Macdonald to convene the Round Table Conference in London, was urged by many Muslim compatriots, including Laikwat Ali Khan, 1895-1951, to become the permanent president of the Muslim League. By 1930 a number of Indian Muslims had begun to think in terms of separate statehood for their minority community, whose population dominated the northwestern provinces of British India and the eastern half of Bengal, as well as important pockets of the United Provinces and the great princely state of Kashmir. The princely state of Hyderabad was ruled by a Muslim dynasty but was mostly Hindu. One of Punjab's greatest Urdu poets, Sir Muhammad Iqbal, 1877-1938, while presiding over the Muslim League's annual meeting in Allahabad in 1930, proposed that the final destiny of India's Muslims should be to consolidate a Northwest Indian Muslim state. Although he did not name it Pakistan, his proposal included what became the major provinces of modern Pakistan, Punjab, Sindh, the Northwest Frontier Province, and Baluchistan. Jinnah, the Aga Khan, and other important Muslim leaders were at the time in London attending the Round Table Conference, which still envisaged a single federation of all Indian provinces and princely states as the best possible constitutional solution for India in the aftermath of a future British withdrawal. Separate electorate seats, as well as special guarantees of Muslim autonomy or veto powers in dealing with sensitive religious issues, were hoped to be sufficient to avert civil war or any need for actual partition. As long as the British Raj remained in control, such formulas and schemes appeared to suffice, for the British army could always be hurled into the communal fray at the brink of extreme danger, and the army had as yet remained apolitical and, since its post-mutiny reorganization, untainted by communal religious passions. In 1933 a group of Muslim students at Cambridge, led by Chaudhary Rahmat Ali, proposed that the only acceptable solution to Muslim India's internal conflicts and problems would be the birth of a Muslim fatherland, to be called Pakistan, Persian, land of the pure, out of the Muslim-majority northwestern and northeastern provinces. The Muslim League and its president, Jinnah, did not join in the Pakistan demand until after the League's famous Lahore meeting in March 1940, as Jinnah, a secular constitutionalist by predilection and training, continued to hope for a reconciliation with the Congress. Such hopes virtually disappeared, however, when Nehru refused to permit the League to form coalition ministries with the Congress majority in the United Provinces and elsewhere after the 1937 elections. The Congress had initially entered the elections with the hope of wrecking the Act of 1935, but, after it had won so impressive a victory in most provinces and the League had done so poorly, mostly because it had inadequately organized itself for nationwide elections, Nehru agreed to participate in the government and insisted there were but two parties in India, the Congress and the British Raj. Jinnah soon proved to Nehru that the Muslims were indeed a formidable third party. The years from 1937 to 1939, when the Congress actually ran most of British India's provincial governments, became the seed period for the Muslim League's growth in popularity and power within the entire Muslim community, for many Muslims soon viewed the new Hindu Raj as biased and tyrannical and the Hindu Congress ministries and their helpers as insensitive to Muslim demands or appeals for jobs, as well as to their redress of grievances. The Congress's Partiality toward its own members, prejudice toward its majority community, and jobbery for its leadership's friends and relations all conspired to convince many Muslims that they had become second-class citizens in a land that, while perhaps on the verge of achieving freedom for some Indians, would be run by infidels and enemies to the Muslim minority. The League made the most of the Congress's errors of judgment in governance, by documenting as many reports 
as it could gather in papers published during 1939 it hoped to prove how wret changed the muslims life would be under any hindu raj the congress's high command insisted of course that it was a secular and national party not a sectarian hindu organization but jinnah and the muslim league responded that they alone could speak for and defend the rights of india's muslims thus the lines of battle were drawn by the eve of world war 2 which served only to intensify and accelerate the process of communal conflict and irreversible political division that would split british india the impact of world war 2 On 3 September 1939, the Viceroy Lord Linlithgow, Governor 1936 to 43, informed India's political leaders and populace that they were at war with Germany. For Nehru and the Congress's high command, such unilateral declarations were viewed as more than insensitive British behavior. For in undertaking to run most of British India's provinces, the Congress thought of itself as the viceroy's partner in administering the raj what a betrayal therefore this autocratic declaration of war was judged and how angry it made nehru and gandhi feel instead of offering loyal support to the british raj they demanded a prior forthright statement of britain's post war goals and ideals neither lilith go nor lord settlement his tory secretary of state was prepared however to pander to the congress's wishes at great britain's darkest hour of national danger nehru's outrage helped convince the congress's high command to call on all its provincial ministries to resign jinnah was overjoyed at this decision and proclaimed friday 22nd december 1939 a muslim day of deliverance from the tyranny of the congress raj jinnah met regularly with linlithgo Moreover, and assured the viceroy that he need not fear a lack of support from India's Muslims, many of whom were active members of Britain's armed services. Throughout World War II, as the Congress moved farther from the British, first with passive and later with active non-cooperation, the Muslim League in every possible way quietly supported the war effort. The first meeting of the League. After the outbreak of the war was held in Punjab's ancient capital of Lahore in March 1940. The famous Lahore Resolution, later known as the Pakistan Resolution, was passed by the largest gathering of league delegates just one day after Jinnah informed his followers that the problem of India is not of an intercommunal but manifestly of an international character. The league resolved, therefore, that any future constitutional plan proposed by the british for india would not be acceptable to the muslims unless it was so designed that the muslim majority areas of india's northwestern and eastern zones were grouped to constitute independent states in which the constituent units shall be autonomous and sovereign pakistan was not mentioned until the next day's newspapers introduced that word in their headlines and jinnah explained that the resolution envisioned the establishment of not to separately administered muslim countries but rather a single muslim nation state namely pakistan gandhi launched his first individual satyagraha campaign against the war in october 1940 vinoba bhave gandhi's foremost disciple publicly proclaimed his intent to resist the war effort and was subsequently sentenced to 3 months in jail Jawaharlal Nehru who was the next to openly disobey british law was sentenced to 4 years behind bars by june 1941 more than 20000 congress satyagrahis were in prisons it was also in 1941 that bose fled to germany where he started broadcasting appeals to india urging the masses to rise up against british tyranny and to throw off their chains there were however few indians in germany and hitler's advisers urged bose to go back to asia by submarine he was eventually transported to japan and then to singapore 
where Japan had captured at least 40,000 Indian troops during its takeover of that strategic island in February 1942. These captured soldiers became Netaji, leader, Bose Indian National Army, Ina, in 1943 and, a year later, marched behind him to Rangoon. Bose hoped to liberate first Manipur and then Bengal from British rule, but the British forces at India's eastern gateways held until the summer monsoon gave them respite enough to be properly reinforced and drove Bose and his army back down the Malay Peninsula. In August 1945 Bose escaped by air from Sagon, but died of severe burns after his overloaded plane crashed onto the island of Formosa. British Wartime Strategy Lord Linlithgow's initial refusal to discuss post-war ideals with the Congress left India's premier national party without an opportunity for constructive debate about any political prospects, that is, other than those it could win by non-cooperation or through violence. However, after Japan joined the Axis powers in late 1941 and moved with such rapidity into most of Southeast Asia, Britain feared that the Japanese would soon invade India. In March 1940 to the War Cabinet of British Prime Minister Winston Churchill sent the socialist Sir Richard Stafford Cripps, a close personal friend of Nehru, to New Delhi with a post-war proposal. The Cripps mission offered Indian politicians full dominion status for India after the war's end, with the additional stipulation, as a concession primarily to the Muslim League that any province could vote to opt out of such a dominion if it preferred to do so. Gandhi irately called the offer a post-dated check on a bank that was failing, and Nehru was equally negative and angry at Cripps for his readiness to give so much to the Muslims. Cripps' hands had been tied by Churchill before he left London, however, as he was ordered by the war cabinet merely to convey the British offer not to modify or negotiate a new formula. He flew home empty-handed in less than a month, and soon afterward Gandhi planned his last. Satyagraha Campaign, the Quit India Movement Declaring that the British presence in India was a provocation to the Japanese, Gandhi called upon the British to quit India and to leave Indians to deal with the Japanese by non-violent means, but Gandhi and all members of the Congress High Command were arrested before the dawn of that movement in August 1942. In a few months at least, 60,000 Indians filled British prison cells, and the Raj unleashed massive force against Indian underground efforts to disrupt rail transport and to generally subvert the war effort that followed the crackdown on the Quit India campaign. Parts of the United Provinces, Bihar, the Northwest Frontier and Bengal were bombed and strafed by British pilots as the Raj resolved to crush all Indian resistance and violent opposition as swiftly as possible. Many Indians were killed and wounded, but wartime resistance continued as more young Indians, women as well as men, were recruited into the Congress's underground. Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941 brought the United States into the war as Britain's most powerful ally. By late 1942 and throughout the rest of the war, U.S. arms and planes steamed and flew into Calcutta and Bombay, bolstering British India as the major allied launching pad against Japanese forces in Southeast Asia and China. The British Raj thus remained firm despite growing Indian opposition, both violent and non-violent. Indian industry grew rapidly, moreover, during World War II. Electric power output doubled, and the steel plant at Jamshedpur became the British Empire's foremost by the war's end. Indian shipyards and lift manufacturing plants flourished in Bombay, as well as in Bengal and Odisha. And, despite many warnings, the Japanese never launched major air attacks against Calcutta or Madras. In mid-1943 Field Marshal Lord Wavell, who replaced Linlithgow as Viceroy, 
1943-47, brought India's government fully under martial control for the war's duration. No progress was made in several of the Congress's attempts to resolve Hindu-Muslim differences through talks between Gandhi and Jinnah. Soon after the war's end in Europe, we will convene the political conference in Shimla in late June 1945, but there was no meeting of minds, no formula study enough to bridge the gulf between the Congress and the Muslim League. Two weeks after the Simla talks collapsed in midsummer, Churchill's government was voted out of power by the Labour Party's sweep of London's polls, and Prime Minister Clement Utley appointed one of Gandhi's old admirers, Lord Pithiclorins, to head the India office. With the dawn of the atomic age in August and Japan's surrender, London's primary concern in India was how to find the political solution to the Hindu-Muslim conflict that would most expeditiously permit the British Raj to withdraw its forces and to extricate as many of its assets as possible from what seemed to the Labour Party to have become more of an imperial burden and liability than any real advantage for Great Britain. The Transfer of Power and the Birth of Two Countries Elections held in the winter of 1945 to 46 proved how effective Jinnah's single plank strategy for his Muslim League had been, as the League won all 30 seats reserved for Muslims in the Central Legislative Assembly and most of the reserved provincial seats as well. The Congress was successful in gathering most of the general electorate seats, but it could no longer effectively insist that it spoke for the entire population of British India. In 1946, Secretary of State Petit Lawrence personally led a three-man cabinet deputation to New Delhi with the hope of resolving the Congress to Muslim League deadlock and, thus, of transferring British power to a single Indian administration. Cripps was responsible primarily for drafting the ingenious cabinet mission plan, which proposed a three-tier federation for India, integrated by a minimal central union government in Delhi which would be limited to handling foreign affairs, communications, defence, and only those finances required to care for such union-wide matters. The subcontinent was to be divided into three major groups of provinces, Group A, to include the Hindu majority provinces of the Bombay Presidency, Madras, the United Provinces, Bihar, Orissa, and the Central Provinces, Virchli. All of what became independent India a year later, Group B, to contain the Muslim-majority provinces of the Punjab, Sindh, the Northwest Frontier, and Baluchistan, the areas out of which the western part of Pakistan was created, and Group C, to include the Muslim-majority Bengal, a portion of which became the eastern part of Pakistan, and in 1971 the country of Bangladesh, and the Hindu-majority Assam. The group governments were to be virtually autonomous in everything but matters reserved to the union centre, and within each group the princely states were to be integrated into their neighbouring provinces. Local provincial governments were to have the choice of opting out of the group in which they found themselves should a majority of their populace vote to do so. Punjab's large and powerful Sikh population would have been placed in a particularly difficult, an anomalous position, for Punjab as a whole would have belonged to Group B, and much of the Sikh community had become anti-Muslim since the start of the Mughal emperor's persecution of their gurus in the 17th century. Sikhs played so important a role in the British Indian Army that many of their leaders hoped that the British would reward them at the war's end with special assistance in carving out their own nation from the rich heart of Punjab's fertile canal colony lands, where, in the kingdom once ruled by Singh, 1780 to 1839, most Sikhs lived. Since World War I, Sikhs had been equally fierce in opposing the British Raj, and, though never more than 2% of India's population, 
they had as highly disproportionate a number of nationalist martyrs as of army officers a sikh akali dal party of immortals which was started in 1920 led militant marches to liberate gurudwaras doorways to the guru the sikh places of worship from corrupt hindu managers tara singh 1885 to 1967 the most important leader of this vigorous sikh political movement first raised the demand for a separate azad free punjab in 1942 by march 1946 many sikhs demanded a sikh nation state alternately called sikhistan or khalistan land of the sikhs or land of the pure the cabinet mission however had no time or energy to focus on sikh separatist demands and found the muslim league's demand for pakistan equally impossible to accept as a pragmatist jinnah terminally afflicted with tuberculosis and lung cancer accepted the cabinet mission's proposal as did congress leaders the early summer of 1946 therefore saw a dawn of hope for india's future prospects but that soon proved false when nehru announced at his first press conference as the re-elected president of the congress that no constituent assembly could be bound by any prearranged constitutional formula jinnah read nehru's remarks as a complete repudiation of the plan which had to be accepted in its entirety in order to work jinnah then convened the league's working committee which withdrew its previous agreement to the federation scheme and instead called upon the muslim nation to launch direct action in mid august 1946 thus began india's bloodiest year of civil war since the mutiny nearly a century earlier the hindu muslim rioting and killing that started in calcutta sent deadly sparks of fury frenzy and fear to every corner of the subcontinent as all civilized restraints seemed to disappear Lord Mountbatten served March to August 1947 was sent to replace Wavell as viceroy as Britain prepared to transfer its power over India to some responsible hands by no later than June 1948 Shortly after reaching Delhi where he conferred with the leaders of all parties and with his own officials Mountbatten decided that the situation was too dangerous to wait even that brief period fearing a forced evacuation of british troops still stationed in india mountbatten resolved to opt for partition one that would divide punjab and bengal rather than risk further political negotiations while civil war raged and a new mutiny of indian troops seemed imminent among the major indian leaders gandhi alone refused to reconcile himself to partition and urged mount batten to offer jinnah the premiership of a united india rather than a separate muslim nation nehru however would not agree to that nor would his most powerful congress deputy vallabhbhai javer bhai patel 1875 to 1950 as both had become tired of arguing with jinnah and were eager to get on with the job of running an independent government of india Britain's parliament passed in July 1947 the Indian Independence Act ordering the demarcation of the dominions of India and Pakistan by midnight of August 14 to 15 1947 and dividing within a single month the assets of the world's largest empire which had been integrated in countless ways for more than a century raising the deadline to boundary commissions worked desperately to partition Punjab and bengal in such a way as to leave the maximum practical number of muslims to the west of the former's new boundary and to the east of the latter's but as soon as the new borders were known roughly 15 million hindus muslims and six fled from their homes on one side of the newly demarcated borders to what they thought would be shelter on the other in the course of that tragic exodus of innocents as many as a million people were slaughtered in communal massacres that made all previous conflicts of the sort known to recent history pale by comparison six 
settled astride Punjab's new line, suffered the highest percentage of casualties. Most Sikh refugees relocated in the relatively small area of what is now the Indian border state of Punjab. Tara Singh later asked, the Muslims got their Pakistan and the Hindus got their Hindustan, but what did the Sikhs get?